we're very pleased to welcome John Riven back tonight, uh, who has uh, produced over 50 plus films about the sea over the last 25 years. Uh, tonight he comes to us live uh, from his writing shed near Bristol, um, and we wanted to conduct this in a slightly different format. So he has a PowerPoint presentation, uh, but he really wants it as a, as a question and answer session. Um, so I'm going to kick off uh, basically asking the first question, and, and that's the subtitle of your book, John, is A Wildlife Documentary Maker's Unique View of the Sea. So would you like to answer, you know, what is that unique view, and what have you seen that you judge as unique? Well, I... Uh, thanks, Mark, and and good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk. I um, uh, wrote a book called The Well in the Living Room, partly finished in lockdown, because um, I'd done an awful lot of filming at sea, and I've been very lucky. You know, I've been to some very interesting places, and, and I, I realised the privilege of that. But also, I've spent hundreds of hours, you know, years at sea, probably, um, in, in the last 25 years, and... Uh, specifically tasked to film strange things in the ocean and it's given me a, a unique view of the sea um and one w which i wanted to share with people i also wanted to tell the story in the book of how um you know we captured those images and and it's a story actually as, as when i thought about it that went back way back um so i did i did want to have a chat because it tends to be a bit of a lecture if if, if you're um uh you know just um talking out into the void uh, and hopefully now you can see this full screen with me in the corner so this is my first slide um, I'll just briefly go through what, what I'm hoping to do so that was the introduction um, curiously in a way the story starts about mapping the sea uh, all these weird animals like the one that you can see in front of you which is a barrel eye fish which is actually a real thing that doesn't look real does it but um, it, it's um, one of the deep sea fishes you know not that uh, far long ago um we didn't know anything about these animals um but it all starts with the story of mapping the sea so do ask some questions as you go along that's absolutely fine you know because that's what i'd like you to do so um it's, it's really what it is if you want to film something if you want to find anything it's a really good idea to have a map so let's go back to what we knew about the world um you know not that long ago only 500 years ago this and this is a map from uh 1502 i think and uh, it's um you, when you look through those maps and you can search through all these early world maps it's really quite interesting you know you can see what it is it's like something gradually coming into focus um and you can see here look there's there's south america um which is just starting to to come into focus we've got all of africa in 1500 we've got a bit of india um we've got no australia of course this is done from our point of view you know from the from the western european explorers um but of course the polynesians they um they were there thousands of years ago you know three thousand years ago they had explored most of of um the pacific and we didn't really even know where they were um and this is a bit of a fragment of a Polynesian voyaging canoe which was found in 2016 not many of these survived because of course they're made of wood this one's 600 years old and these things were massive um they probably each hull had the diameter of this this shed probably bigger and and um you know they they could um stay at sea for many weeks but also they were incredibly fast. Something like this did about 25 knots, which was phenomenal compared to the uh, Western uh, boats, the European ships, you know, the our, um, sailing boats made out of, uh, you know, 700 oak trees. And they really, ours were quite clunky compared to this. So in something like this, you could probably traverse the Pacific in, if you were lucky, probably under three months, which is quite phenomenal. Um, so we, we don't really... Um, in our culture have a full understanding of how the Polynesians were such excellent explorers. And uh, this is lovely because um, on, on the on the hull, um, they found some turtles, um, which are, are the symbol of the, there's that bit of the hull, by the way, that you can just see it. Uh, I don't I want to point, but hopefully you can see the bit of the hull that that was. If I go back, that's that bit, that's that bit there. Um, so these things were massive and they had sort of upside down sails. They'd learnt to, the Polynesians, of course, had learnt to sail against the wind. They didn't have big fat rudders sticking in the water because that would 
cause drag. Um, so they just had some paddles and then they twisted the um, sail. So that's how they, they uh, steered it, which, um, and so everything was done to put it into racing trim. And that's how you get mm -hmm. to those phenomenal speeds with these things. So here's that turtle. And um, the uh, Polynesian, in Polynesian culture, the turtle is really important as a, they saw some symbolism in it in, in an animal that was able to go between land and, and sea. Um, and um, that's why they've carved it on the on the hull of this. John, can I ask you a question there? I mean, yeah, what what, um, what I mean, what what made the Polynesians actually step off the end of the earth? Because surely, you know, they, you know, I guess, they're really conscious that you know the 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 view of the world was only very uh, narrow, and therefore, you know, to my to transverse. You know what could be the Pacific, for example. You know, was an extremely, I would assume, an extremely dangerous thing to do. Um, do well, we know why? Yes, that's true. But we've gone to the moon. We go. There is something in human beings that makes us explore. It's mm -hmm. probably to do originally with trying to find new resources and things like that. Um, and uh, perhaps also the Polynesians considered the ocean more like a country than than a than a. You know, we we've got our views of the sea so for instance today in even today in in um the aboriginal australians will call the sea the salt water country which is a beautiful thing because this it, what what that understands is that the sea has hundreds of different places it's not this homogenous blue that we see on our maps you know so mm. um maybe they they thought of it like that and so therefore and with these what this wonderful technology of these fast boats they could they could conquer it and the, and so it wasn't difficult for them to, to you know in in many ways i mean i'm sure they had their mm -hmm. disasters in storms and things like that and they were navigating by uh, very subtle things uh, where birds flew and and um you know knowing the, some of the stars and and the water currents they made maps of water currents with sticks and stones you know they mm -hmm. but but those methods we underestimate because they had explored the whole of the pacific you know 3000 years ago um yeah. you know um i think that you know obviously some of the later islands like easter island and new zealand i think were one of the last sets to be found but um even new zealand is about 700 years old you know mm -hmm. 700 years ago before um people colonized it so right, thank you yeah i think it's a, so now um you know i our present maps of the sea uh, of, of the of our world of our planet are still fairly rudimentaries i mean of course they're detailed on land this is what you get if you look at um google um earth and the two little red dots I, i'd love to point to them but i'm not sure how to maybe i'll use my cursor so those two little red dots there yeah. are the challenger deep the marianas trench mm. And this is relatively r low resolution here. I mean, you're lucky that this is even seen because most maps don't have any relief in the sea at all. And that's sort of three quarters of our planet, which they've ignored because the seabed is, its structure is important and it's important for, for where you find different animals. And it's important, um, you know, because whales will find the ridges so you can guess where they might be if you know some of the seabed structure. And as I'll show you in a minute, there's some of the, our new discoveries are directly as a result of, of knowing more about the fine detail of the seabed. So, um, so this is just my a, resolution. So just matters. a quick question yeah. on this, if I may, um, with reference to the, <clears throat> with reference to the modern day mapping techniques. Um, I mean, we, we know, for example, with the, uh with 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 trying to find the aircraft that that that, that went out into yes, the I know. I Southern thought about Pacific uh, and and you know the, the the challenge they had with reference to sort of finding uh or or or, or not actually finding that particular um uh, 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 aircraft uh, but the but modern mapping techniques i'm assuming are still based upon uh, sounding methods um uh, from yeah, vessels just... or, or have <laughs> we gone sort of you know well, into as space far as I understand it um so yes with sonar and side scan sonar and the and mm. the fidelity of them has got better i mean it's yeah. true of true of any technology you know when you first start it it's a bit crude i mean think mm -hmm. of the first digital cameras that we had in the in yeah. baton 1999 you know they did two megapixels yeah. and now you can get you know 35 megapixels but it's basically the same technology i mean car engines i mean they, they 150 years old basically the same technology but they they work a bit better than they used to so any technology we can kind of invent we we make better uh, uh, the other thing that's been happening is that the diff that and i'll explain it in a minute but 
as far as I know, um, people are now collaborating and they're pooling their data in this um, what's called the Seabed 2030 study. And that is a study which it aims to map the whole of the world's seabed at a 100 meter resolution, which is similar to what we've got maps of Mars and so on. Um, and mm -hmm. um, and that's just not being done. So here, here this is it's, it, what you can see in front of you is this is this um, this is the difference in resolution. So you know on on one side we've got the blurry picture of a low resolution image, and on the right um, we've got the high resolution. And this is why it matters because if you look off Florida, it, this is where this particular image is. You can now see an ancient riverbed down there, and and, and you know I'm certain that if you were to go in down into that ancient riverbed there would be different creatures in 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 those gaps down there so you looking at that detail you can you can now look for new things so just so this this is um so the seabed 2030 project to make the world's um oceans mapped at 100 meters resolution um is part of something called the general um uh, that's the sphere um I'm just trying to remember what GEBCO stands for. You probably know, but um, and it's basically a mapping system to to um, integrate what's known. Now, this is an image from Australia where you can see all around the edge. So the the the, the red areas are quite well um, mapped, and then you can see tracks where they've sent side scan sonar. And of course, in in the bits in between, nothing really has been done at high resolution. I just thought out of interest, you might like to see the UK. Yeah. Um, John, so, there was a, sorry, the question on the chat that says, uh, "Where was that on the Florida coast?" Oh, uh, okay. okay. So going back, um, it looks like it's north of um, Venice Beach, uh, right at the top bit. I couldn't tell you exactly, but um, there, I'll give you a link in a minute, or, or a um, at least a tip as to where you can look at these maps because they're online. They're available online, and GEBCO is. Um, is the gen general bath i can't say it but it's basically the the survey um which they're doing with nippon the nippon foundation for seabed 2030 so if you have a look at seabed 2030 and search it in google all this will come up um so here we've got the the uk map and you can see of course actually the uk is probably one of the best studied places um but then off the continental shelf it's all missing again so um now why is this important one so one i want to come now to one of the things that we filmed for blue planet one uh, it was quite extraordinary and it was filmed in the gulf of mexico and um so just south of louisiana you may know that the oil industry um has got up to well i think about forty thousand structures in the gulf of mexico because it's the americans have have extracted a heck of a lot of oil from there um and uh so on our google map here with the red lollipop you can see our typical knowledge of this of the sea is just the uniform blue but of course if you start to look at the structure of it and here on the right is, is a structure from the seabed you can find some interesting things and um this is something called a brine pool the gulf of mexico flooded and uh, evaporated thousands of times in history and i think you go back several hundred million years and there is now and as you know every time you evaporate ocean water you get salt there are some places in the gulf of mexico which have got five miles of sediment salt in them and they're also super concentrated pockets of salt and that's what these brine pools are. Salt is, is very plastic and it comes up to the surface. Um, and um, well, I say surface, it comes up to the seabed and it, and it, it's pushed between the gaps between rocks. So this is a, a lake of super concentrated salt. And I was lucky enough to visit this in um, on the first blue planet. This was we went with um, the Johnson Sea Link submersibles. And that's what, what this is. Um, they were decommissioned in 2011. But um, this was 2001. We went down to the brine pools. You can see here, which is on my left, but I don't know whether it's your left, uh, is the um, Johnson Sea Link, um, it, uh, probably about a mile down on one of those brine pools. And what its light is shining on is, is a, um, a shoreline. It's quite surreal when you come across these because they, um, they look like a lake underwater. And uh, um, 
you know, you'd never think that that's the sort of thing you might find, you know, a mile down on the seabed. And around the lake, they have got um, mussels. So as well as that salt pushing through the, the seabed, um, the super concentrated salt, it's about eight times more concentrated than seawater, are um, gas deposits and methane. Um, and the animals that are living there are not, they're living in the dark, they're a mile down. They are living, they're living on bacteria that can convert the methane into usable food. It's a, a hydrogen sulfide metabolism. It's not a, anything to do with any of the well-known uh, ways that we breathe or plants make make food from light. So this is hydrogen sulfide. It's a, it, if you like, it's the third way. Actually, some people think it may have been the first way, and that life, that all life, evolved around these these um, places like these seeps. They're called. A question, called sorry, can I ask a question? Just yeah, please, if I may. Um, but for clarity, I mean, in my mind, then, you know, there is um, a necessity for a, a very still and very um, uh, a stable environment to to be able to enable these particular salt pools. Um, uh, um, but yet we've, you know, we've got the uh, threat of from the oil industry, for example, in order thinking they may actually possibly be drilling somewhere close by. I mean, is yeah. there a is there a challenge between, um, uh, you know, industry and uh, the ecology of these well large... very much so i think seabed mining is a big issue at the moment um i think we're, we're about to be weaned off oil but um yeah. so at the, t at the time that this was happening the reason they were using this johnson sea link submarine was really not mainly for uh, research on marine biology it was it was something called ground proofing so um the u.s government sells 20 square mile blocks of of um of seabed in the gulf of mexico to mm -hmm. prospecting oil companies and in fact they rent it over a period of years so so um if you have oil in that block it's worth a hell of a lot more than if you don't and mm -hmm. so so this submarine was was trying to prove whether it, those areas were likely to have oil or not and you know if they were then the rent is 20 million for 10 years and if there's not then it's you know half a million for 10 years so so mm -hmm. um so that the, as usual the imperative to explore our planet is nothing to do with with um you know the wonder or or interest in it really mm -hmm. it's to do with the economics um and yeah. and a dive in one of these at that time was costing twenty thousand dollars a dive so because you have a support ship and everything so you can imagine but the, and who's got the money to do that well the oil industry and we were piggybacking really off some researchers and, and people who had windows opportunity to use the mm -hmm. submarine outside oil use. Yeah. yeah. But, but also um, just for clarity, again. sorry, also just for clarity, I mean you you yeah, I mean you mentioned uh, I suppose the wider topic of 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 seabed mining because you know one has seen you know the the, the challenges with diamond mining off South Africa for example. Yes. So you know it, there is there is all these natural resources you know, out at sea that, that you know, have yet to be exploited. And, and, you know, that, in my mind, that could be just a, an absolute demise of that, the... the... Well, it, it could be, but isn't it like everything else that we're facing at the moment, you know, mm. that, that we're, we're starting to understand what a devastating problem global warming is um mm -hmm. and, and we're we're trying to do something about it it's always a bit of a race you know we're, we're, we're usually slightly behind the curve and and let's hope that you know that isn't going to be catastrophic but yeah. it's it, I, I have a feeling and i see it in my children as well that people are going to become more sensible than they have been in the past yeah and mm -hmm. they wouldn't want to be naive of course industry will drive a lot of things um and we need yeah. it you know, we all use the stuff it's just yeah. about being more sensible than we have been in the past and, and I, it's a huge issue um mining um i'm not sure i can really go into it in, in yeah. much more detail but <laughs> but yes it is oh, it is perfect. something that we need to talk about so um this is what uh, is those that's another view of the brian paul now, this is, these are some of the beasties that you get. So that, that's a close up of these m very clever mussels that live on hydrogen sulfide and they form what looks like pebbles around the shore. They presumably die when they come to, too close to the, to the brine. Um, but there's a certain zone around the brine pool that they, um, you know, they like and they survive in. This, um, the reason I'm showing you this is because the, this is, this wasn't, this is a habitat that was unknown until the 1980s, you know, and it comes about by looking at what's on the seabed and, and knowing from the sonar what, what detail there is. 
and then you get these other things these are um these are tube worms th- th- these also grow in shallow water you're probably familiar with them um i know if you ever dived in uh some of the locks north of oban there's some much spectacular examples of them but they but they tend to be the shallow water ones but they and they also make a structure for other animals that live amongst them but these ones are, are uh, living down uh, uh, again at about a mile down on the seabed and um They've done some very clever experiments um, staining the tubes, and they found them to be very slow growing, something like an inch every 200 years or something ridiculous, But um, uh, which tells you how old these reefs are down there. So this is weird, and this, this, is, <laughs> this is what I like about the sea, and, uh, and this is what I mean about a different view. So what on earth is this? This, the white stuff is um something called methane hydrate so so at these coal seeps you get methane coming out but because it's under pressure it it, it um it forms a kind of a methane ice um and um it basically it, it's a solid lump of methane uh, and these are polychaete worms they're they're um, you know, related to our ragworms on the beach uh, but they are not eating normal stuff they are eating bacteria that live off the methane hydrate which is extraordinary, really. Oh. And this is so. This is the sort of thing you see if you dug into the sediment, uh, not so far from some of those brine pools. So that was so. That was just to, to, to um, talk about um, how uh, you know mapping the sea is important, and how we um, have found great new things because we've mapped the sea at higher resolution, and how we are continuing to map the sea. In fact, there's a big drive. I think this decade is called the UN Decade of the Oceans, isn't it? So that's part of it as well, trying to make a bigger drive to understand the sea. So um, I think the other subject which I'd like to talk about is is about uh, the blue whales, um, which we filmed in uh, Blue Planet in the first series. And I was the... Um, I was the producer who did that. That was our crew in the centre there. That's me about 20 years ago, looking a bit more hairy. Um, <laughs> so um, we, we um, opened the first Blue Sat Planet series with um, blue whales. And um, how do you film blue whales? Had In fact, surprisingly few people had filmed them at all, um, given that they're the biggest animal in the sea or perhaps that has ever lived. And uh, so there are certain places that you know are, um, you know, well uh, researched. And um, that's what you do as a filmmaker. You ask the researchers first, where where, you know, where, where do you find a blue whale? One of the answers is um, in uh, Baja, Mexico, which is, which is um, you know, obviously the extension of California, the bit that wasn't stolen by the USA, um, but um, the so it was a part of California. There's a thin leg, which is still Mexico, and um, so on the on the left hand side, we've got this is what you what a blue whale looks like when you see it from the water. Um, you were you know quite a, a distance away even with that shot, and that's it blowing it as it comes up, um, come up every forty minutes or so, and do that in, in a different place. So one of the reasons why they're so difficult to film is they're incredibly fast. They can be, uh, they can do 30 knots if they want to. And the only time you're going to catch them up is if they're, um, feeding. And of course you, 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 I say catch them up. You can't chase them because they are, um, protected animals and you have to have filming licenses and you have to be very careful. Um, so you, you have to take this slowly. So this is 1999 in, um, the Sea of Cortez. Uh, which uh, the Americans call uh, the Gulf of California uh, in Mexico. And um, so finding a blue whale, even though it's the biggest animal that's ever lived, is incredibly hard. I don't know if you've ever even tried to follow a dolphin or something. They soon disappear from you. Um, so the, one of the best ways to do it is to spot them from the air. And we had employed, this is Sandy Lanham with cameraman Rick Rosenthal, and Sandy is, uh, she's a woman who studies the, um, or helps the Mexican government study their uh, populations of, of blue whales and other animals, but uh, blue whales in particular. And she had this very old Cessna. It's one of the oldest flying examples, actually. But she um, swaps out the engines every two years. Um, or at least she did at that time. And we're talking about two, uh, 1999 to about 2010, something like that. 
Um, so that's what we filmed these wells from, and we spotted them um, from the air, um, which is a, a whole different ball game. Actually, being able to see it's probably the best way to find whales uh, is to is to look at whales from the air. Um, just to give you an idea of what it's like flying in that Cessna, I've got a couple of clips from my YouTube channel. I'll just play a little bit of them so you can get an idea. Let's try this one. I don't know if you can see that well enough, can you? Um, it's moving frame by frame almost. Oh, we're getting there. Oh, wow. So, um, I, sorry, did you see that properly or was it, was it too... Yeah. Um, that was okay, okay. actually. It, it was okay. Moving. All right, so, so moving. Then you've got this lovely, if I wind to the front of that, you've got these lovely um, uh, mountains. The Sea of Cortez is, is a beautiful place. Um, I don't know if you've ever been, but it really, okay. the colours on the mountains change all the time. This is, pro I would say that image is blue, so it's probably late evening. Uh, but, you know, in the morning, they'll be golden. Um, and um, so we've, let, let's, let's, um, this, this, this also shows a similar sort of thing. But a different view. So that's this is this old um, Cessna, and you can imagine it vibrates like mad. Um, and uh, this is what we filmed those the opening shots of Blue Planet from Blue Planet One. Um, and uh, we probably spent about fifteen days doing this, I should think. And the whole trip, I think, was twenty five days. But what, once we see the um, whale, then the uh, airplane will. Um, radio the, the the boat and and give us the coordinates um in fact we were worried sometimes that we were giving coordinates to a rival filming group which is from national geographic and uh so we had a code for we've seen a blue whale which was send a taxi to puerto and escondido <laughs> a question um is is a blue whale a migratory species i yes it is um yeah. but um it, the Sea of Cortez is special because um, it's probably one of the carving areas. Um, and mm -hmm. um, let me just work this out. It's probably one of the carving areas. And a lot of the the um, mother and calves are, are to be found there, particularly in the early spring. And they may, some of them may stay in the Sea of Cortez for protection. Uh, there is another well, that's probably the same population, but they do migrate all the way up to uh, from, you know, San Diego. Well, they go around the outside of the peninsula all the mm. way up to Monterey and, and further north, probably. Um, and um, so that's a, quite a journey, although, you know, since a blue whale can probably do, I don't know, average cruising speed. Let's say it's, you know, 10 knots or more. Mm. You can cover, um, you know, uh, 200 miles a day you can do the math it you know that, that sort of journey is several thousand miles but it it, it will um, um be covered by a blue whale fairly quickly um so um these are aerial shots of blue whales this is from my friend mark cardine and mark is um does well watching tours in um baja um and has spent an awful lot of time there but you can see what i mean by how beautiful these animals you saw the shot earlier from the water which was just the spout and um actually when you look at them from the air of course they are blue so why are they blue because actually when you when they come through the water they're kind of gray and uh, what i think is happening is it's like the, a white beach that it has a reflection it's reflecting the surface water is what's happening that's why they're blue but it's interesting how, how the first sailors knew th them as blue as well and i guess they must have been looking at them from the top of the masts um Sometimes they're also called sulfur bottoms. They have um, a yellow bacteria. I haven't seen that very much. So the one on the right is um, is feeding. You can see its mouth filling up with um, with krill, probably. And they also eat a little red crab, which is in um, which is occurs in swarms of, of millions in Baja. Um, and the one that's in the middle, of course, that's mother and calf. That calf is probably relatively old i'd say by its by its size maybe it's been with its mother for a few years so um that's what i mean by perhaps some of them don't migrate um if they've got calves uh, a lot of it this isn't really known you know where we still don't know where they breed nobody has ever seen a blue whale mating as far as i know mm. um, john there's a question from mercedes here on the chat yeah. uh, um are you allowed to tag blue whales to track them at depth and um, is this uh, even have. technically possible uh, due to the depths? No, well, it is. It is possible. They're not. They're not hugely deep diving whales. They're not like sperm whales, 
but um they um uh they do I'm, I'm sure they go pretty deep I mean, several hundred meters i'd imagine but uh, we did tag them with a scientist called Bruce Mate from the University of Oregon, who was tagging them way back in the in the late nineties um, with quite big um, sort of tagging units, um, which he he had permission to um, he fired them into into them, and they have batteries and satellite um, uh, uh, data, which which uh, every time they surface would go up to the satellites. So they, he got he's got quite a lot of good data about where they go. Um, and in fact, um, there's the somewhere called the Costa Rica Dome, which uh, he found that they went to, and that's where they think they might mate. But since it's about sort of 500 miles offshore, you'd need a very big ship and a lot of money to stay there for days on end to film them. Um, and nobody's ever done it. So, um, yeah, so you can tag them. This, by the way, is what it looks like um, from the water. This is so. This is what the chances are of you getting a, a a good shot of the blue whale, and this happened very often. And remember, we can't chase them, so we we actually had a little panga, a little dinghy out on the water, um, and we would have to hope that the whale surfaced near the panga. Um, I had a little scoreboard going, and the number of times it surfaced, and it wasn't close enough to film. Uh, on the 25 days that we did it 158 a uh, number of times it surfaced and it was close enough to film twice so it was whales 158 humans two was my final score but you can see you can see what it you know how difficult it is even though this is the biggest animal that ever lived now this is the shot now you see this in the first in the in the um this is actually one of mark Carwardine's shots but but it's very similar to the shot that's in the um in the in the blue planet um opening sequence the first series and it's the shot we wanted and this this is one of the two times that we gotten close enough to do it um and it became a fairly iconic shot of of blue planet one so you know we had some success because we used that aircraft and because we were able to coordinate the aircraft and the boat and because we had enough time we had 25 days you know to do this so um then we get david attenborough out to um to do the uh an introduction um this is actually the first um one of the sequences in in the life of mammals as well as the blue planet it was what we call a shoot chair and we they, so obviously these things are expensive so we did did it for both shows um now this is actually using what we was the a whale that was tagged by bruce mate because you couldn't have david for 25 days um you know you might have him for three days to do this so you have to be sure that you would get a blue whale and the way that we did that was to go with the scientist who had tagged them as someone was saying earlier so that's the end of the blue whale section now what i'm going to do is to go back to the deep sea um i quite like the history of of the oceans as you know um and this is a um this is a, a scientific um plate from the um uh HMS Challenger expeditions and um, HMS Challenger was the first ship to invent oceanography. So now, uh, so we're talking about the 1870s and um, here it is fitted out with a laboratory inside. They, the, it was an old um, naval gunship and they, um, they stripped it and they put in laboratories, they put in um, trawler nets and various sounding equipments of the day. Um, they really went to town. It was um, uh, came from the University of Edinburgh. A lot of the initiative, but um, it's the first uh, HMS Challenger. Uh, yeah, 1873 to 76 went around the world nearly three times um, and had a very regular routine of sampling everywhere. So what, one of the things that they um, found was that a lot of strange deep sea fish, and this is one of the strangest. This is something called a gulper eel. Um, and it comes from the middle of the sea. We tend to talk about the seabed and the surface. And, you know, I was talking about the seabed earlier, which is important, you know, um, has features which affect all the animals in the sea. But actually, the biggest place to live is in the middle of the sea, not either on the top or the bottom. Of course it is, you know, because the sea on average is about two miles deep. Um, and um, these creatures are from the middle of the sea and the technical term is mesopelagic. Um, and again they're very difficult to come across one of the things that i why i wanted to show this was because this is a picture of, of over 100 years old uh, of a gulp reel 
And since it was first known about, we've learned very, very little more other than what it looks like, really. You know, nobody really knows how it breeds, how it feeds, you know, how it, uh, it's got thought to have a bioluminescent tail, but nobody really knows. Anyway, I was lucky enough to go on a, uh, on a scientific uh, cruise, which was trawling from the deep sea. And so um, this, that's another way of, of getting samples from the sea, of course. Uh, a submarine, a submersible is, is probably great, probably one of the best, especially if you switch the lights off. Uh, but um, they're very expensive and, uh, and they don't cover much area. So one, pe- one way people do this is, is, to, um, is to trawl. Now, I've got a, 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 some footage which... Um, I, 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 it was actually an amateur sort of shoot. I, I only did it out of interest. Uh, it wasn't a BBC shoot um, because I was invited on on this scientific cruise from uh, the Harbour Branch and the, and the Scripps Institute in in Florida with a colleague called Julian Partridge. Um, and so, um, anyway, I, I didn't know what to do with this footage. But a few years later, YouTube came along, and I started a YouTube channel. And actually, it's had a, about nearly a million hits about this um, gulp reel. So I know people are interested in it. I'm just going to going to spot through this a little bit so you can see what I'm talking about. This is the same animal that you've just seen in those pictures. And this is the opening of the of the the channel. Can you hear the the audio? Um, not really, not really. Okay, well that's all right. So what what I, what I was saying is that it, so this is the, this is the I'll try and wind to the right bit. That is the gulp reel that you saw in the pictures. I mean, it's a very weird um, fish with a very big mouth. Um, and it it lives at about six hundred meters, and uh, there, so. That so there, there there's a picture over there. It's got quite a square body, um, and at the end of its tail, it's got a bioluminescent organ, which is that, um, and that's a lure, of course, which it dangles over its head. We think nobody's ever seen this um, to catch uh, prey. Um, somebody did film it uh, live recently, um, and there, there, look, this, this is get fine detail. We're filming this in a tank. Um, because what happens when these samples are trawled up, when this animal's trawled up, is of course it will eventually die or pretty quickly, um, partly because of damage in the net, but also um, temperature difference mainly. Some people say pressure difference, but actually these animals don't have air spaces. They do, evolution has made them get rid of their air spaces and they have different ways for flotation. Um, so they're well adapted to the to the deep depths of the ocean. But the, so I'll just show you this. Those are hairs on the on the tail. Nobody even knows this. There's no scientific paper that's 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 pointed this out. But those hairs are probably trigger hairs, which which if, a, if something comes nearby, it'll eat. You know. Um, anyway, um, then you we we filmed this in in great detail with macro lens. Yes, this is a point I try. So this is the gulper reel in the in the Natural History Museum, which is a little bit you know, worse for wear. Um, and it has also been sort of reconstructed. It looks almost like it's been repaired with paper mache and painted. So, so the trouble is that you, if you don't have the real live animal, you can't see it properly. This is what happens in um, samples are uh, kept in form formaldehyde. They often decay, and, and again, you know, they're limited use to to see what the original animal looked like. So, um, and let me go ahead on this. I just wanted to show you a little bit of the ship, actually. Let's, let's, so you can see this is just, it's just a big scientific cruise ship. And this is something called the cod end trawl. Um, so it's a net that can be opened and shut at different depths. And, and this occasion was opened at 600 meters. And then it, you have to trawl it for several hours because although, as I was saying earlier, that is the biggest part of the oceans. Um, the actual density of animals is not huge, although the absolute numbers is probably more than anywhere in the world. Um, so you get the sample in that um let's let me see if i can let this run yeah so this is the cod end which is where all the uh, fish samples are um, yeah there's the mechanism for opening and shutting the uh, net at different depths yeah 
Yes, let me just go. Uh, so you control day and night, of course. That's what this is what the, what it looks like when you open up the cod end. And these these are the samples that come up from the middle ocean from 600 meters. So you've got dragonfish, all sorts of things that were in that early challenger picture. It, uh, John, it's still quite a primitive method of um, it's a very primitive scientific method. research, as it were, because yeah. I guess we've been doing that for a number of years. Yes. Well, it, it, it's not that different from what HMS Challenger was doing in 1870. Indeed. Um, um, and uh, that's the sort of the point that I wanted to make, really, is that, that we, uh, you know, we're still a little bit behind the curve on what we know about the sea because of the way that we're tackling it. It's partly funding, though. You know, and then the and and here's the thing: if you could make it cheaper to to film the sea, and I think I can, I think we can make it cheaper um, by um, using all the small cameras that we have and many other methods um, which are coming online at the moment. But uh, yeah, you're right. You've either got this, which is um, trawling; you've got the submersibles, which are fiendishly expensive. Um, or you've got landers, which are just sort of frames left on the seabed um, and then re, uh, re picked up again, you know. So, um, and of course, that's the cost. The, the, the deployment cost of these things is actually more than the things that you're making, you know, because you have to leave it somewhere and go and get it again. Um, and, you know, how you do that is pretty complicated, but it's also very expensive because you have to send out ships, you know, far out into the ocean. Which is, you know, the explanation for why actually, you know, we're still in the 21st century. We still don't know a lot of our ocean. So mm -hmm. this this um, is the filming tank that we use, which is called a Chrysal. It's a circular tank. Um, and uh, you've probably seen it if you've ever gone to an exhibit about um, jellyfish. Um, and um, the thing is that it makes a circular flow. And so nothing sticks to the side, um, which means that you can film it a bit more naturally. Um, there's some deep sea jellyfish and stuff in there. And there's our gulp reel, poor old thing. So you know it would the it was it was pretty much dead when we when we found it. So here's the, the here's an ROV of course, which is I think in this video I'm trying to um, explain how that you've got different methods. And again, hit so he this is the HMS Challenger nets, so not that different to what we were using. Mm. Um, so I'll try and get out of that now. Um, yes. So um, that was the section on the uh, weird deep sea fish. I think you probably guessed that. <laughs> now we're coming to uh, to something else. So what do you think this is in the jar? Have we got any takers as to what that might be? Yeah. That um, is the biggest eye in the animal kingdom. It belongs to the giant squid. And... Uh, and the giant squid lives at, at 1400 meters or deeper perhaps as well where it's pretty dark pretty much virtually all dark i'd think so why has the um why is the biggest eye in the animal kingdom found in in the dark um in the deep sea and that um is an interesting question because it leads you to try and understand all sorts of things uh, is it not sort of try to determine its predators by looking at, toward the skyward yeah, and, uh, uh, possibly making silhouettes. I don't know. I mean, well, I'm, I'm sure that would help in shallower right. water. Um, the um, uh, the thing is that um, probably at 1400 meters there isn't any skyward. Well, it's not mm. much anyway. Um, you probably know about this battle. This is the apocryphal battle between the giant squid and the um, and the sperm whale, and um, the sperm whale eats giant squid. Um, I was lucky enough to meet a man called Malcolm Clark um, in the Azores, and Malcolm was a, um, uh, an, a scientific officer on whaling ships up until '86 when they stopped whaling, and he um, was at the present sort of dissection of, of um, sperm whales essentially when they were caught, and um, he looked at the stomach contents, and um, he'd find about twenty thousand beaks, which are the hard part of these. Um, uh, they're about this sort of size the hard part the mouth parts of squid which are in the stomach of um of sperm whales about twenty thousand in the average um sperm whale three percent of them were from the giant squid they were really big beaks um so we know that they eat that that sperm whales eat um giant squid we could we also see scarring on the side of sperm whales of of the suckers of of giant squid so we know that this battle happens but of course nobody's ever filmed it 
Not yet, anyway. I mean, goodness, that'd be a nice thing to film, wouldn't it? But um, so I was involved in the project with a chap called Martin Dawn, who's a who's a very um, very good engineer as well as a, an excellent filmmaker, and he uh, has spent most of his life looking at um, how you make cameras sensitive to low light and he turned it on a project um to find the giant squid and he had a theory which i can explain um actually probably explain with the help of this so you have probably seen uh, <laughs> i put burnham burnham on sea here because actually i, I don't think it is burnham on sea but I, one night i did see that in burnham on sea which is just just down the way from bristol um and uh it, it, it was bioluminescent jellyfish in the waves you, you, I don't know, you might, might have been lucky enough to see the this sort of thing happens all over the world. In fact, the sea is full of full of bioluminescence. Uh, on the left is myself swimming in the uh, Mosquito Bay in, in Vieques, which is in Puerto Rico, which is known to be the most um, bioluminescent bay in the world. Um, however, if you've got the right cam camera, then everywhere you go, the sea glows. And um, Martin's theory, which um, we tried by using various um cameras with a very high sensitivity is shown by this crude picture um the bioluminescence of um and how why is it how is it caused i mean if we go back to this this is actually jellyfish in the waves but there are um smaller creatures called dinoflagellates which are um which when every time they're disturbed they they cause bioluminescence which means that anything that travels through the darkness underwater uh, deep depths is causing disturbance of these dinoflagellates and causing bioluminescence so it makes a, a halo around itself um and probably the shape of the animal itself is black so we were hoping to see a black outline of a um, giant squid using these very sensitive cameras um it's, it's a big long story in itself and it was made into a film called hunt for the giant squid for national geographic um of course, did we ever see this? Well, we saw something that may have been a bit like this, but of course, one of the things about filmmaking is that you, you, you don't necessarily need to um, have the ending you think you're going to have because it's it's about the journey and it's about the idea. So you can make the story if you um, if you just have a theory because, and then you can use the film to explore that theory. So that's what we were doing in that film. But so bioluminescence in general, as I was saying, is everywhere in the world. Um, this is a mock-up of a lanternfish. The lanternfish is supposedly the most common fish in the world. Um, mm. And, mm. Sorry, do, do go ahead if you want to say something. Uh, not sure. Is there anybody ask, wanting to oh, no. ask a question? No, no. That's all right. No, please continue. Uh, I... I um, yeah so the so these are light organs within the the skin of the um of the fish and they you know there may be various reasons why they're trying to use it perhaps as an identification so that they can see each other particularly when they're breeding or when they want to shoal together because of course in the dark they wouldn't be able to find each other necessarily but then of course you run the danger of of um risking being seen by a predator um but i mean this this is unusual to see one lantern fish you'll see them in that hundreds of thousands there's a scene in in the big blue um program which i made for with the, our team on blue planet 2 and um you know you just you, you just see tons and tons of lantern fish in the in, in the water together but um this just shows the light organs on the lantern fish and different species have got different patterns and on the on the right we've probably got some marine worms which um use bioluminescence to court but on the theme of uh, unusual things that, that I've come across in my filming and a different view of the sea, I came across this animal. And this is a, a something called an ostracod. Uh, you know, it, um, difficult to really place it. But in fact, there are there have been 70,000 species described and there are about 15,000 living species. This is the biggest of them. This is a giant ostracod. It's about the size of a table tennis ball. And you can see inside it's got two lights which are a bit like car headlamps they're, they're sort of um, bowls um, which collect the light this particular one this species is not known to bioluminesce but it has a relative can you see what i mean about the sea being full of strange things this is a creature that none of us really understand or know you know and, and even have any 
sort of reference as to what it is, you know, because it's a it's a ball with two car headlamps for eyes and and one one or two little appendages which help it swim and it tumbles as it goes through the water. Um, so um, anyway, I want to talk about one of its relatives. This um, is a Caribbean ostracod, and only about thirty years ago or so, it was found to be produce light and the males only produce the light and the way they do these by the way is they mix two chemicals together one which is basically a, a catalyst of the other which causes the glow um and the these animals which are this particular thing is probably the size of a flea um and in fact it, it is very like a water flea but it is an ostracod it's like that uh, one i showed you earlier but uh, it can produce this light and why does it do this so this was found off um south water key in belize um where i'd actually dived about 30 years ago and not seen them then i went back in 2011 with a scientist who showed us where they were and they're only in two meters of water and um this is what they're doing so this is what it looks like when you dive in that two meters off Southwater key at the right time of year at night and these are male ostracods using morse signals in light and they are doing it in in different directions according to species. So you've got ones here in the middle that are doing it diagonally, and they're going blip 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 diagonally. And then there's a, then there's ones doing it horizontally, as you can see. Um, and then about seven, eight, nine, ten blips, different numbers according to different species. There's ones that stay still in the same place. They're another species. So there's horizontals, verticals, diagonals, and stationary ones. And they all come together. What they're doing is they're displaying to females who presumably, although you can't see them because they don't bioluminesce and, and it's dark, are nearby watching this. This is what's uh, biologically it's called a lek, where you get a group often of males that come together to attract females. And um, it's like a, a sexual marketplace, you know, where the females take their choice. But um, and then, as I say, it's usually males, although in hammerhead sharks, the fem when you see a shoal of 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 hammerhead sharks it's often thought to be a female lek to try and attract a male um but anyway um this kind of starts to blow your mind doesn't it i mean this is this is um, like you you dive in two meters of water and it starts to look like a christmas tree underwater and then you realize that this thing the size of a water flea is making different signals and not only that the different species make different signals um, and it's controlling that bioluminescence. If we go back to this picture, you know, this is what it would look like if you had it under a microscope. Um, it's controlling it incredibly well, you know, and that signal will then disappear. Um, and then, um, you know, presumably they mate or whatever, but um, 30 years ago that was found. Um, right. So I think... Um, We've been talking now. I've been talking now for 50 minutes. So so what um, I thought you might like to, to know, uh, being divers, is something about the underwater housings, the camera housings that we used. And this is um, so these are some of the Blue Planet. This is the first um, edition of Blue Planet. And on the left, you can see two different camera housings. The one on the left is a video camera housing. It's not even um high definition it would have been 720 lines and in, uh, in those days about 1998 uh blue planet one was what well, it first started the first research started in 1996 and it went on it was broadcast in 2001 so um you know a five-year project uh, but in that at that time so this the camera inside there wouldn't be as good as your you know canon dslr today sure. um but it was good enough. Um, and uh, the, the, the housing on the right is a um, uh, an ARRI housing. So it, it was one of the last film cameras called an ARRI HSR2, um, obviously made to the shape of the camera. But th the fact that these things are big and you could just about carry out of the water, you can just about carry one of these um, is good because it, it gives you stability. And one of the prime things of a professional shot underwater on video is not having it jog just keeping it rock solid and of course it's extra mass helps you do that um this by the way is peter schoons on the on the right hand side and, and that is it so he made one of these housings himself in his own workshop uh, the two on the left were made by a guy called vince pace who went on to make this make work with james cameron on avatar and made the 3d system so you know it's quite 
um, technical engineering going on. Um, what else have we got? Uh, this is in this is interesting. So well, you know, if you really get stuck for a housing, glass isn't a bad thing. When we were trying to film those giant squid in the in the dark, this is what we use. These things are good to three thousand meters, um, and they don't even have o an O ring seal. The ca the cap uh, of the the top of this tube um, will um, it's just ground glass like your decanter bottles for whiskey or or mm -hmm. sherry. And and the two surfaces meet, and then then you you use a bit of masking tape to to make the two surfaces stay together, just so the top doesn't fall off. But as soon as that gets to ten meters or more, it's not ever going to come off, and you you barely trust it at first. But it works this system. And the other thing with this glass is that you can grind, you can optically grind it. So normal glass won't necessarily be um, good optically. So, so you can have the front ground i seem to remember it, the bill for that was about seven thousand euros but it, but you still got it you've still got a cheaper housing um and you've got one off the shelf um so um i'm sorry i'll just get rid of that um so yes uh a question i mean it, with all these housings and so on i mean I, assuming that they're you know uh, uh, well, they're going to be operating in sh relatively shallow depths, or, or 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 are they just designed depending on what one what environment one needs to utilize them in? Yeah, well, they, they the other housings. The, so these ones are, are these are never going to go beyond diver depths, so fifty meters. Yeah. Yeah. But this these glass things are um are going to these are good to three thousand meters. They're, they're made by wow. a company called Vitrobex, and and uh, are there other similar companies? companies and the other thing that's interesting about them is you can get them off the shelf because the scientific community uses them mm -hmm. and uh, you know obviously if you ask engineers for something complicated quickly then uh you know the answer might be you can have it in in you know 10 months uh which is not a good answer for television which usually gets um you know it gets a project funded and then it, everybody wants to go immediately and to have it ready in in, in a few months um so um except for blue planet which is slightly unusual but um so um, yeah. it's uh, a good Mick solution. Said, Mick has asked a question. Um, how how did you focus the lenses? They were done um, right. So we had a live feed to these things. We had a um, a fiber optic cable coming out of the back, which was five hundred meters long, and um, we had we flew these things on a um, um, a special. Um, it looked like an underwater glider made by martin dawn um and um so we had a live feed from them and there were some servo motors on the on the lens um pool and so of course we could just we could see it you know and and uh, we could send send the signal back to to focus it i mean it, it, it probably to be honest would have been very very wide uh, in which case as you know a lot of the image would have been in focus anyway except for the first you know couple of meters in front but yeah, it's um, and of course the other way you do it is the pig-headed way. So this is my my uh, housing that I made uh, for filming time lapse of things like um, anemones, and this is made from spare parts. Really, you can see a, a, a strobe that you probably recognise if you're an underwater photographer, um, and that's an Icolite, um port which I've stolen from an old um system and this box is an aluminium box which was welded by some welders who do some welding in exeter um at the airport i think i gave them 25 pounds on a friday afternoon i think the whole thing cost me about 600 pounds to make um but it did some some time lapse um which was quite nice and, and it, it, nowadays you'd probably do this within your own housing but of course having a bigger housing like this means that you can put more batteries in it and you can leave it down longer this is so this is not video this is this is a, a stills camera that's taking a shot every six seconds and the strobe is recharging so um you get some very nice um images doing that uh, it's a bit of a fiddle though i've got the some of the results of this up on my youtube channel in duna and you can see the you can see what this does with say things like dahlia and enemies um and the detail it gets from it now nowadays it'd be superseded by you know ones that were probably off the shelf and, and nicely made but um i just put this up because it just shows you you can do stuff 
that you maybe think you can't um and you can do it relatively cheaply of course it soon becomes much more expensive to, to deploy this than it costs to make it because um if you want to you know hire a, a boat obviously for a good time um it's going to cost you know for a week or so it's going to cost you much more than 600 pounds this is a uh, so this um this is from 2014 filming in in uh Fakarava. So that's another story I might put in next week's talk, which is about um, the um, how we came to film the natural feeding behavior of grey reef sharks at night. But that, that's just to show you what you what the rig would look like. On the left there, you've got a um, uh, a very big gantry of about twelve LED lights. So you're really lighting that up at night. Um, and also another feature of this is that that uh, you can see the hands of that man there or that person there. And the stalk up to the lights. That's because sharks come to lights if you're not careful. So you do not want your hands near the light, which we discovered to our cost. Mm. Anyway, um, so finally, um, I have a, um, a thought about what we might do. So this is a picture done with Steve Hathaway in, in New Zealand. Um, and so I've talked about some of the extraordinary things that are in the sea, like those, um, bioluminescent, um, ostracods um like the you know the cold vents the, the brine pools but this is something that at the end of blue planet 2 we were just beginning to explore it is in blue planet 2 actually but um so these big dark creatures are um false killer whales and these are bottlenose dolphins in the front and they have been found to cooperatively hunt together and we think that they change this is still not quite proven but that they change their acoustic communication when they meet to talk to each other across species and they will um you know that's extraordinary isn't it two different species um changing their language like an esperanto to talk to each other um if it's true i think it is true um and so why would they do that um i think these big false killer whales can dive deeper and, and the bottlenose go wider so between them they will catch more food if they talk to each other What's also extraordinary is that this is in New Zealand, they're cooperative, but in Hawaii, you know, false killer whales have been seen to eat dolphins. So um, the other concept we have is is about whales and dolphins having a culture, which is, um, you know, so that they're doing something different in New Zealand to what happens in Hawaii, but they're the same species. Um, so that's, uh, you know, I, I hope perhaps somebody will give me a chance to film these and to prove that idea. But I'm sure there's many, many other things. In fact, uh, one study says that there's at least uh, 20 animals to be found in the sea, which are bigger than two meters that we haven't seen yet. So that's uh, something to leave you with. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I'll finish there, I think. Great. Uh, thank you, John. Um, I uh, um, I guess for me, I mean, it, you know, is the I'm, I'm assuming there is still filming going on for yet another series of Blue Planets. Is that is that well? True? It takes an awful lot of uh, money to get uh, things like that together. I'm sure you know. I hope that there, there will be something like a Blue Planet Three. I know that there's some big projects going for Netflix on um, on the oceans, um, and you know, generally speaking, you know, Amazon and Netflix and and the other streamers are good news for um, our industry because um, they cause you know budgets to be raised to to cover the cost to to do these detailed films on the sea and I'm, I'm, i really hope they will have them. i mean the, the idea that there isn't enough material there's they could you could go on forever you know you could mm -hmm. do blue planet 10 if you wanted to but um yeah so it it's hopefully a good time for filming the sea mm. and i mean the funding is that uh, does that come essentially from the bbc or is it sort of private funding and um, uh, how, the, how does how, how does one get the the funding if you don't oh, mind? Asking? It's it's a quite a long process, but um, the general funding process in uh, television is um, is basically to put a, an idea. So you have an idea, and then you you write something about it. You write two or three um, uh, pages, and then you um, get that as good as possible. Make a brochure, maybe, and then it goes up to the commissioner of the channel. Uh, the people that, that are the gatekeepers to the money of a channel. Mm -hmm. And then they um, say yes or no. But of course, um, 
you know, understandably, they've got a limited amount of money. They're not going to say mm-hmm. yes to everything, and uh, it's quite a long process. And usually, for a show like the um, like the Blue Planet, that isn't enough money. Um, even if they say yes, they will partly fund it. I mean, the BBC is a big funder, of course, mm-hmm. it is. It has the license fee, and the income from the license fee is about four point five billion a year, I think. So, um, so it, it, it's un- that's one of the great things about public broadcasting is that it's got the money to 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 seed at least those projects. So, Blue Planet One, if I remember rightly, was a co-production between BBC and Discovery, um, and the um, and Blue Planet Two was also a co-production of various sorts with you know the largest part or a large part um, being from the BBC. Yep. There's a couple of questions on the chat window. Um, one is uh, uh, from Seb Daniels said, what is the name of your YouTube channel? All right. So it is um, Induna. Uh, Induna is uh, so I-N-D-O-O-N-A. And um, that's because my father had a little boat that he was always talking about called Induna. Um, and he, he loved the sea. So um, I thought I'd name it after him. But anyway, so... Um, uh, it's called in uh, and the I've got a link here on this um, last slide. I don't know whether I can put that up on and uh, or even indeed if, if people can see it. Um, uh, let's see if they can. But uh, okay. there is the link to it in Duna Oceans backslash C backslash YouTube dot com. But, uh, you know, if you search for Induna and and search for Gulper Eel and you'll find it because uh, I've got the top three hits, funny enough, on Gulf <laughs> <laughs> There's not much competition. <laughs> <laughs> There's a um, question from Mercedes as well. If I may, if my uh, uh, that I may ask, what is the biggest hurdle to overcome for deep sea research, funding, or technology? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, well, I'm not sure really, but I, I know that one feeds into the other. So that if you, um, you know, technology is helping us make it cheaper. Um, so one of the one of the unfortunate things about seawater is that it absorbs radio waves um and it's very very good at absorbing radio waves because if you if it didn't you could put a drone in the water but you can't do that that's why you 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 have to have a um uh, something that's attached um to get the signal out if you want to get it out live mm-hmm. you have to have a wire attached to the rov or or these whatever the camera that you're dropping over the side of the boat you have to have a wire now the problem with that is that is that there's a swell in the sea and your boat will pull the camera up and down and quite a lot as you know you know the swell can be quite high so being free not untethered is really good and submarines are untethered but they're very expensive um so can we crack the problem of um passing a video signal which is um now broadband width through water and the answer is yes you can and people have have recently proven it through fiber optics they have if you think of uh, fiber optics without the fiber so just a signal flashing they've got two cameras that uh, uh, a sender and a receiver and this and, and it flashes uh, the fiber optic light and the other one picks it up. I think it's got to be about 100 meters away, but that's still, that's not a problem because you can drop one part of it down underneath the ship and it's not tethered anymore. Then it's not pulling on it. Um, and then your camera is free. So now you can pass signals through the, the water. Um, there's a company called Sonodyne. There's several others that do it, but, um, and it was invented in Woods Hole in Boston about 10 years ago. But that sort of technology promises to revolutionize, um, imaging of the deep sea because you could effectively make things like drones which can fly around underwater untethered but um it's still very expensive of course thank you um can i invite anybody else if they want to open the microphone for um uh, to ask uh, john a question um or or if you wish to write it in the chat window uh, how about do you know where uh, how how you can get my book (laughs) <laughs> oh <laughs> that is a good question john it's I called mean, the whale in the living room and you can get it on amazon and uh-huh. it's got it's got a lot a lot more of these stories in it and um yeah it's a nice blue whale picture from uh mark carwardine there yep there is yes please would like to buy your book uh, that's from maria right, nice. so please Thank you. give you a uh, a well, big uh, thumbs up already 
So next week, um, I think I'm scheduled to talk about the top five diving sites that I've come across in Blue Planet. I deliberately didn't include any of that in this. So um, mm -hmm. hopefully we can go through that. And uh, yeah. There's no. one little question just popped through from Chris, which says, um, have you a preference for camera systems, stock lenses, et cetera? Um, well, I get, it depends on what you're really talking about. I, I mean, we, I like those big heavy housings if you're trying to do professional um, underwater work. Um, and uh, you know the companies. I probably you know, don't want to say one over another, but we uh, have used a lot of Gates equipment, Um Gates tend to be more um, rod orientated rather than electronics orientated. Electronics and water will always go wrong, of course. So anything that's more reliable. Nauticam, I personally use some Nauticam housings, which I like because they're very ergonomically, they're beautiful, actually. The, the I have to say some of the early Icolites were difficult cameras to use. However, their parts were good. As you saw earlier, I, I cannibalized some of them to make that time lapse unit. Um, and um i guess you know you can go you can go very small with cameras nowadays um and um that's good too because you can get into sort of crevices and things in corals or whatever um but of course that's going to be much more bumpy on the other hand it's um it's very convenient you know you can, and uh what i find is that when i go on a shoot now and probably we've got about six different cameras at least of various sorts Mm. Great. Thank you very much. Um, um, so you, just John. looking down the list here, there is a number of uh, people saying thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Um, 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 looking forward to next week. Um, thanks. Uh, fascinating stuff. Thank you. So there's a lot of positive feedback. Oh, thank you. That's nice that. to hear. So well, uh, and I, I love to see and, I, and, and, and it's great to be able to share it with people. Mm. Um, so yeah, just one last comment. Is anybody uh, anybody on any other questions, or uh, shall we proceed to wrap up uh, this week's uh, Bezac? Uh, one thing I can tell you though is that yes, is that um, I started with Bezac at university. This is you know got a lot to do with Bezac. How um, how I learnt um, my first courses in the swimming pool and played octopus with Bezac people. So um, you know, thank you for that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I remember playing Octopus back in the day. I was uh, originally from uh, St. Helens, Wigan area, which was sort of rugby territory. And I think the our version of Octopus was more or less underwater rugby. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I, I played it for several years. It was really good. And it gave me the confidence. I was quite a slow learner, but I, I, it gave me the confidence that, you know, for diving to become a second, um, second nature, which, of course, it has to be if you're – concentrating on on um on photography i mean that's why i love underwater photography you not only do, you've got to do all the things that basically keep you alive and safe you also have to think about you know your f stops and your various framing and your lighting and all that stuff so it's a wonderful wonderful mix of art and technology mm, yeah, yeah to be honest i've, I've actually just been uh i've, I've I've just started doing a little bit of underwater photography and it's incredibly difficult, I have to say, um, you know, uh, because there is just something <laughs> to think about. Uh, yeah, it uh, is, I suppose so, but it's in, it pays it, it, it big rewards. I mean, there's so, so many wonderful creatures, aren't there? I yeah, know. yeah. And, yeah, because uh, there's the yeah, sort of like the focusing, there's the getting the right uh, attitude of the of the picture of the subject matter itself. And uh, then there's the buoyancy control that comes into play <laughs> and it's, yeah yeah it's uh gosh yeah 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 quite complex without a doubt john thank you very much um, thank you very much everyone um, I, I, um, I can't see you all it's a bit um blind but um i hope it's okay and um we'll see you next week yeah Yay. that's very kind Yay. all right all the best great thank you very much john